Long ago. It was said in a letter. Mankito is a village of log cabins and many saloons. But as the village grew, new residents looking for work or starting a business had their own unique ideas about the character of the place they would soon call home. Almost every day I live out my interests in fitness and exercise. At my age, I am curious about what my body can still do and what I can do as a person at this moment. But I don't forget about the past lessons and experiences that brought me here to this place. Outside, evidence of the generations that were here before me holds a view on a sidewalk or a street or while looking at the river valley and the hills that surround it. I, like others, move further into the present, but look back now and then to find inspiration by understanding more about the people who shaped our history. Nine years after the American Civil War ended, a war hero, a Union Army officer and a cavalryman who rode with the Army of the Potomac joined other men in Mankato to form a Young Men's Christian Association chapter. Edmund M. Pope, always honored as General Pope, became the chapter's first president after being part of the effort to organize a group of young men from the First Baptist Church, the First Presbyterian Church, and the Centenary Methodist Church. Early adult church members quickly embraced the mission of the Young Men's Christian Association, convinced that it would make a difference during times of temptations and hardship. They believed that a mix of work and play could help develop in Mankato boys and young men physical efficiency, sociability, and good fellowship. But after a few years, this first attempt at organizing a Young Men's Christian Association came to an end, most likely because there was no permanent place or building where members could belong and participate. In 1892, rented space in a building on South Front Street's 300 block gave the Young Men's Christian Association of Mankato a second chance. There was enough room to organize boys and young men for regular activities and hosted events. Two Mankato men, George M. Palmer and William G. Willard, made the restart of the YMCA of Mankato successful. With the help of a few others, they came up with the plans and put the goals in place to establish an organization that would become a permanent part of the community. They raised funds and drove the construction of the town's first YMCA building on a corner of 2nd and Cherry Streets, nicknamed the Building on the Corner. The building opened its doors in 1904. If present-day YMCA members walked into Mankato's first Y building, many of the sights they'd see would seem familiar. A friendly greeting would welcome them as they walked up to the front desk in the rotunda. Friends met and greeted each other in this area. A wood gymnasium floor with a basketball court included different types of exercise equipment and a running track that seconded as an observation deck. 
A pool allowed swimmers from advanced to beginners to benefit from the exercise of swimming. Nearby, posted bulletins announced the times for swimming lessons. Lifeguards, who followed rigorous lifeguarding standards, watched over the swimmers in the water. But there were differences. A barber shop, where hair was cut and trimmed according to the latest styles. And dormitory rooms, which accommodated out-of-town guests. A bowling alley, without the luxury of pin resetting machines, saw its share of league competitions. Exercise and athletic competition of all forms dominated the building's schedule of healthy activities. But the men who brought the building to life created an environment where the appreciation of culture and the arts, especially music, was strongly encouraged. In this parlor, many girlfriends and spouses made their first entrance into the YMCA of Mankato upon the invitation of the men who were members. The improvement of knowledge by reading and attending lectures took on the same importance as the strengthening of body muscles. During the building's early days, boys 9 to 18 were eligible for memberships. They were asked to follow codes of conduct. The only responsibility was that they were to be complete gentlemen, maintain decent activity, and respond to suggestions and training points. And uh, if they didn't do that, they were asked to leave. These codes of conduct may have seemed strict, but boys and men leaders from local businesses flocked to a building on the corner. The YMCA in Mankato was here to stay. George M. Palmer and William D. Willard enjoyed high regard as businessmen committed to bringing more businesses to Mankato and creating prosperity to make life better for the generations yet to come. The best way to do that, they believed, was to foster the development of the boys and young men of their town, who would do their part one day in growing the community and seeing it prosper even further, living out the examples demonstrated by Y leaders such as Palmer and Willard. A native of Wisconsin, George M. Palmer moved to Minnesota and took up residence in Mankato after attending a St. Paul Business College. After a few years, he got involved with the Mankato Flouring Mill before it was eventually renamed Hubbard Milling Company, combining his talents with those of R.D. Hubbard. Later, a Hubbard Milling Company co-founder and company president, he had his hand in most of Mankato's business affairs and government plans, probably more than any of his contemporaries. William D. Willard was a classic example of the man about town, an organizer, a big picture thinker, and an eloquent speaker. He enjoyed life to its fullest. He found the greatest happiness when he was in the company of young people, advocating their development and giving voice to their potential. For years, he worked at the First National Bank holding different jobs. He pursued community building opportunities outside of the bank. And no matter how busy he was, he had a way of finding the time for recreation. William D. Willard's father never fancied his son's interest in camping, hiking, and the outdoors. But William D. Willard camped, hiked, and cooked by a campfire whenever possible for most of his life since he was a boy. After graduating from the University of Minnesota and returning to Mankato, he started putting together local boys' trips to Lake Washington. Camping, hiking, and being in and around the lake brought forth those days of summer sun and splashing and swimming in the water. Everyone looked forward to those excursions to the lake, especially William D. Willard himself. William D. Willard was born in Mankato, Minnesota in 1867. It was him who pressed the idea of restarting the town's YMCA, even though the notion at first received little support, but he believed the Y deserved a second chance. 
At the time when he was six years old, his father purchased a house on State Street, and there he lived with his family. He was the first boy in town to buy and own a bicycle with rubber on the wheels. He entered a 4th of July bicycle race, competing against a boy who pedaled a bicycle with iron wheels. He won the race on that 4th of July and received $5 in prize money as the first place winner. He often wished that he could return to his childhood and relive the fun and play times he had with his neighborhood friends, like so many of us who are children of Mankato have wished. As an adult, he was a much sought after community advocate and town leader. When U.S. President William Taft arrived by train to give a speech in Mankato, William D. Willard had already been given a place on the reception committee. He rode in President Taft's parade procession as it traveled through the town, the sidewalks crowded with cheering residents. After President Taft had departed from Mankato, a local news report proclaimed William D. Willard's hometown to be the metropolis of southern Minnesota. Mankato's reputation as a forward-moving 20th century community began to blossom. At the dawn of this new century, the worldwide YMCA organization reached a higher level of recognition as America entered the First World War. Thousands of young Minnesota men wore Army Doughboy uniforms and prepared to fight in the battles in Europe alongside the French and the English. To give them comfort and aid overseas, they found YMCA huts or small canteen shacks or buildings stocked with food, coffee, and other items to offer battle-weary soldiers and Marines returning from the field. The YMCA volunteers who operated the huts were called secretaries, including men, but some women from the United States. Together, they faced uncertainty and danger while carrying out their wartime duties. They proved themselves to be inventive and resourceful when supplies and support were hard to find. And in 1935, YMCA and Mankato Board of Directors meeting sat General Secretary Bruce Bell, who spent most of his entire career serving the Y. George M. Palmer and William D. Willard also attended the meeting, sitting side by side. The meeting's conversations turned to the fact that the town's Y was growing in popularity, which increased demands upon the building's structure and its staff of workers. A growing list of demands meant that the organization would have to overcome plenty of challenges in the future, some identified quickly and others never imagined. In time, World War II spread through Asia and Europe. Our friends overseas witnessed and personally felt the impact of the enemy bombing raids on Allied cities. Sensing that it would not be long before America became involved in the war, those affiliated with the YMCA in Mankato chose to be ready for anything, putting into motion the values practiced in the building on the corner. Help the Y mobilize Mankato manhood for defense through good citizenship. The Mankato YMCA recognized the 100-year anniversary of the birth of the YMCA organization in the Y's English founder, Sir George Williams. In June 1944, this recognition transformed into a tribute to service, leadership, and courage, honoring those who were associated so intimately with the Mankato YMCA, yet who served in World War II, giving so much of themselves so far from home.
and waiting inside the Y was a place where young people gathered for recreation and companionship after the United States entered the war. The Alpine Attic opened its doors to serve as a social club in partnership with the Mankato Social Agencies Council. During wartime, your students of high school age gathered around a portable radio to catch the latest breaking news and listen to network radio shows. A food service counter, complete with a soda fountain, satisfied the appetites of visiting sailors, soldiers, and Marines, as well as members of the local teenage civilian population. Murals of the Swiss mountains filled the walls of the Alpine attic, complemented by old country style decorations. On busy nights during World War II, more than 400 young people mixed and mingled at the Mankato YMCA's Alpine attic. In addition to the Y's exercise and athletic activities, tabletop game competition captivated players of all skill levels. The money to buy an Alpine Attic jukebox came from seven families who lost their sons to the war. One parent who contributed money was Mankato YMCA General Secretary Bruce Spell. His son Bud died in a bomber training accident in Illinois. The 1940s finally came to an end. The 1950s arrived. Looking back at the predictions from the 1935 board meeting, repairs and remodeling efforts could not solve the wise ever mounting building problems. The building outlived its capacity to serve the wise mission in Mankato. The Greyhound Bus Company bought the patch of land and constructed a bus terminal where the first Mankato YMCA building sat after the Y finally demolished the building. In the meantime, eyes turned toward an old West Mankato home on Park Lane, Oscar W. Schmidt's house. The Schmidt family was also connected to Mankato's historic past, once known to be the makers of saddles, bridles, and other accessories for horses, later on, the sellers of leather goods. The Schmidt House presented a mid-American mansion, circled by lots of lawn space and adorned by beautiful greenery during the spring and summer months. Railroad tracks lay just yards north of the house. It was a stately sight to behold. Keeping the house as a centerpiece and adding a larger structure to the house for a swimming pool, a handball court, and locker rooms form the beginnings of a plan to build the new YMCA location in Mankato. In 1958, the Mankato YMCA purchased the Schmidt House and property. But it was not until almost three years later that groundbreaking began for the new YMCA location after the goals to raise funds were achieved. In between old and new buildings, Y events and activities continued in meeting halls and big rooms like those at the American Legion. The all new Y opened for review with the public invited to see what the Y in the 1960s offered old and new members. Around that time, Jim Buckley, who started as a general secretary and earned the position of executive director announced that the all-new Y on Park Lane would become known as the Mankato Family YMCA. The Mankato Family YMCA made good on its commitment to deliver a recreational experience for whole families to help build stronger bonds within each household. The Y also sought out single people to join the organization for fitness training and athletic programs, as well as being able to take advantage of a place where long-standing friendships were made. Before words like diversity and inclusion became part of our everyday vocabulary, the YMCA's presence in Mankato led the way, 
through action and commitment, welcoming all people regardless of race, faith, gender, or economic status. In the early 1960s, campaigns were conducted to women to encourage them to become members of the Mankato Family YMCA. By late 1964, the number of programs for girls and women equaled the number of programs for the men. The Y Health firm in its belief that exercise, athletics, social events, and youth development programs made a difference in the lives of all of its members as well as the community. But it still advocated things like good citizenship and other time-honored YMCA values handed down from one Y generation to the next. In the future days ahead, it can be said that while the seasons come and go and the years move quickly on by, the youngest among us have their chances at creating lifelong memories too. Underneath the roof of our local YMCA, an organization that confidently faces the challenges of changes in time, where journeys to the future begin, fueled by the knowledge from lessons learned and experiences gained here on a wood gymnasium floor with a basketball court around friends who share the same enthusiasm for having fun, being part of healthy activities, and helping develop each person to his or her fullest potential. Alongside others who bring out the best in themselves and ourselves, when a particular moment calls for all of us to do something together we once believed to be impossible, leaving our footprints on history in a southern Minnesota town called Mankato.